Okay, so good afternoon. I am so excited to have you all here today. And I am especially excited to welcome Roshanna Lorraine Witt and Benjamin Ignatz to our very first Reclaim Your Face webinar on the topic of Roma and Sinti rights and facial recognition. This is such an important topic because whilst there are many experts within the within Romani communities working on issues of data and digital rights, those of us in the digital rights field often don't have much awareness of this work and why it matters so much. And this webinar also comes at an especially pivotal time because the European Commission are going to be proposing a new law this Wednesday, which is expected to include new rules for facial recognition and other biometric tech in Europe. So I'm Ella Jakubowska. I work as a policy and campaigns officer at EDRI, which is a network of 44 digital rights organizations across Europe. And I'm also one of the coordinators of the Reclaim Your Face campaign, who, and we're fighting to ban biometric mass surveillance across Europe, so fighting creepy facial recognition and other uses of tech that take our faces and our bodies and use them against us. Um, and I'm going to just quickly post some links into the chat in case anyone is interested in looking a bit further into the topic. Uh, so, without further ado, let's now get into the juicy bits of our webinar and uh, hear lots of what Benjamin and Roxy have to say. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to pick on you first, Benjamin, because I can see you first in, in my uh, list of videos. Can you tell me just a little bit about who you are and the work that you do? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ben. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a Romani researcher and activist from Croatia. Uh, currently, I live and work here in Berlin. Um, last year, I graduated with a master's in public policy uh, from Oxford. And that is kind of where I started getting into big data ethics and digital rights. Um, this is the exact area also that I'm uh, exploring right now as a research fellow at the Roma Initiatives office. In at Open Society and uh, why particularly technology. Um, I've always been a sci-fi nerd, I guess, and uh, fascinated by tech, new technology, data, uh, and research. And being surrounded by data and technology, I uh, my whole life, basically, I, I realized how big of an impact it has on shaping our society. And um, I firmly believe that it can help technology is useful in many areas of, uh, of life, but also recently we started seeing the potential damage that it can cause to, to marginalized people like, like Roma. And that is exactly what brought me here today and to this field of digital, digital rights. Fab, thank you, Ben. And Roxy, what about you? Who are you? What do you do? And why are you interested in data and tech? Uh, uh, thank you so much for introducing us, Ella. I'm, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here today with you and Benjamin. So my name is uh, Roxy, which is uh, short for that long version. And uh, yeah, uh, obviously I'm a simple person as well, but uh, uh, I was head of the education department at the Central uh, Council of uh, German City and Roma until last year when I decided with other people to found or own an organization, Safe Space, which focuses on empowerment, emancipation, inclusion, diversity, and particularly also that, um, digitalization, which is my specialty, as I was also introducing that topic back when I was at the Central Council, as I was seeing there is a lack of awareness among Romani communities in general and also Romani organizations when it comes to big data, technology, gaming, all of that, uh, uh, kind of nerdy fields and how I got there and how I got my kind of special knowledge. I think it started just the same way that Benjamin started getting into this. Back when I was a teen, I was not that uh, a usual girl, how you would say it or how you would perceive it nowadays. Uh, I was always into tech. I loved everything that was 
um, about gaming. I got into gaming and to the gaming scene. And then the first social networks started to arise. We all remember MySpace. We all remember MSN. And that where when the internet was fairly unregulated, not how it is today, where we're where we are discussing international policies on data regulation, facial recognition, but back then everything was pretty wild. And I was like, okay, there's something wrong here because of course, when you're getting into this, um, the first identity you're getting into this is you're a nerd tech and you want to learn coding and you want to learn what is it with all the forums where people are uh, discussing what is the dark net and whatever. But the second um, identity that comes with me is my identity as a city person. So I was like, okay, why is there so much racism in this room and how do we fight it? And this is basically what I have spent the past 10 years to figure out how can we uh, tackle um, all the issues that are related to our community in these spaces. Great. Well, thank you for the intros, uh, Benjamin and Roxy, and, and for everyone that is watching, I think, um, to just say we're so grateful for both of you sharing your expertise today. And, and wow, what a lot of different things you've both covered. So uh, I'm super excited for us to get into this. Um, although I will say that uh, I, for one, would rather forget the days of MySpace. Um, that was probably a particularly embarrassing part of my history, but uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're talking today about uh, Roma and Sinti rights and, and how they intersect with technology and, and facial recognition uh, specifically, uh, but maybe just taking a step back a little, for people that don't have a huge amount of knowledge of Romani communities or Roma and Sinti rights in Europe, what's something that you would want them to know? And maybe Roxy, if I could uh, ask you to go first. Uh, well, you know, when we're uh, going to the topic of who are Roma and Sinti people, like there's a large Romani population that not only consists of Roma and Sinti, but also of travelers, of Yenische, of uh, uh, particular populations who are calling themselves Kaderash and Manush and and so on and so on. There's a lot to learn about Roma and Sinti issues. We will not be able to cover all of this, so I'm glad we will provide a readiness after for everybody who wants to get into the topic. Just let me say that often the term minority is mentioned in the context of Roma and Sinti issues. However, with around, I don't know, there's it's only estimated numbers from 16 going to 21 million people in Europe. This is definitely not a minority. It's our, our, around 30 times the population of Luxembourg. So we're talking about a huge amount of people living in the European Union and um, uh, yeah, and outside of the European Union, all over the world, so. Absolutely, and, and Benjamin? What for you would you want people to know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Roxy on this. Um, uh, we are a large minority and there's a lot of things that we will probably not cover during this uh, call because there is so much more that people should know. But as we will focus on this digital gap, that should be probably mentioned that Roma and Sinti are not only socially and economically excluded, uh, they're also digitally excluded. Um, in, in Europe. Um, I mentioned earlier how we all depend on technology. This has probably become more visible during this pandemic than ever before, how so many people are working and studying from home or just being at home and depending on all of these things. And as usual, the EU is neglecting the fact that the majority of Roma, and there's a lot of us, uh, <laughs> Uh, the majority of Roma are still poorly connected to the internet. Uh, we have reduced access to digital technologies, uh, lower levels of digital literacy uh, compared to the average citizens. And um, I understand digital rights as a field of human rights is fairly new concept. It's really exciting, the intersection. Um, and it still baffles me how Roma people who are disconnected digitally and severely unprotected from these new technological threats um, how these people are not part of the conversation at the European level, at the national level, at the NGOs level. Um, the lack on, of investment, I think, in this digital aspect of Roma rights, uh, Roma and Sinti rights, is um, is going to just keep us at the bottom in a way. And um, and overall, in the race of growth and development, we will we will be uh, lagging behind if we are out of the loop. Yeah, go for it, Roxy. 
I can only second what Benjamin said. I would like also to mention uh, that is very important that when we are talking about digital literacy, it's not only the average Germany person who has limited access to digital literacy, but also the big organizations that are representing us on an international level. Like you would never think of people who are so high level politicians that are lacking digital literacy and also it's like a lot of burden of shame to admit like you have no clue about this but it's not only Romani people that have no clue about this and being in high positions but also Gaja people so non-Romani people who are lacking digital literacy and are not involved in the importance of the topics as of uh, mass public surveillance, biometric data collection or facial recognition. So when we're talking about digital literacy for Roman people, it's like how to access the le least privileged people amongst the communities, like and all in average society, as well as people who are high stake, uh, high profile uh, politicians in European or international politics, who are like, you know, not really engaged in such important topics and how to give them digital literacy because you, you mentioned it, Ella, in a few days people will decide over our fate on a European level and I estimate not only Romani people but a lot of Gajo people as well don't know what they will be deciding on. Yeah, I think some fantastic points there. You know, I, I think that or we know uh, that a lot of NGOs have started talking and activists as well about how underrepresented Romani communities are in EU policy making and EU decision making. Um, even when we were kind of drafting the, the concept note for this webinar, we were talking about how uh, Roma and Sinti people are often not looked to as sources of expertise, but you know, in, in, as victims or um, in a tokenistic way only, and, and how vital it is that we move beyond that to recognize the vast amounts of Romani expertise that need to be built into these, these policy decisions. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and on the digital literacy point, uh, it's it's a huge problem um, that we have this gap. And, and Roxy has been supporting us at Reclaim Your Face in how we can make some of our materials more accessible, how we can reach people that for whom you know, the, the term facial recognition might be completely meaningless and, and feel really alien to people's day-to-day -day lives. Because um, that's, that's not even just an issue that impacts Romani communities. There are lots of communities across Europe, right, for whom facial recognition is something abstract and difficult to grasp why it actually matters for us. So hopefully today we'll, we'll delve a bit more into that um, about the implications of the use of some of this to this tech. Um, so before we get into that, I just want to stop to think a little bit about the concept of identity, uh, which we've all kind of agreed is important when we're talking about this topic. So, you know, identity is complex and multifaceted and contested in, in many ways. Um, so in your experience, why is identity important when we're talking about these topics? And why does identity need to be protected and celebrated? Um, so, Roxy, if you would like to take the floor. Well, first to start off with the term identity. Like, you know, the premise of facial recognition technology and biometric uh, data collection is that you can tie certain facial features, for example, or even when we dive into all that genetics uh, research in scientists is currently done, that you can tie certain uh, carboxyl groups on your DNA to an identity. But identity is a social construct, a social political, social economical construct that is not exclusively tied to facial features. For example, how many people have during their history always been known to adopt because we are very like Family is a high value, children and elderly people are high val highly valued in our communities. So when we see a, a children that is all for, uh, or children that are orphaned, we have taken them as our own children. So there will be children who are not genetically and also not in their facial features be tied to anything that, for example, facial recognition, recognition te uh, technology or, or genetical technology um, and science relies on all those premises are suddenly crumbling apart because those people are equally recognized as Romani people nowadays because the adoption uh, has happened like multiple generations ago. So, you know, and they also identify as Romani people. So who is really Romani? 
who is a really Roma or a Sinti person, you cannot tie this to 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 the ma to mathematics of your face or or of your uh, of your genes. And uh, or maybe I should mention also the history of biometric uh, data collection in that way it has has always been tied to discrimination and even to uh, uh, to a mass murder of very many people when we think of the history of uh, biometric data collection we need to go back to the holocaust i really uh, i'm sorry that i have to mention that here because it's overly mentioned however um the first human experiment been done on sinti and roma people in Auschwitz. And how were these people identified? There were people like Robert Ritter, like Josef Mendele and uh, Eva Justin, who were traveling towards who they estimated to be Romani and they were measuring their faces with rulers. Okay? And that were then suddenly people were taken into concentration camps who did not even identify as Romani people. They were high stake Nazi people being put into the concentration camps and gassed as Germany people who never identified as Germany because if they would have identified, they would not have been supportive of an ideology and of a an regime that aims to, you know, completely uh, erase Germany people from Earth. So you see that uh, you can see how failed premises of uh, of identity leads to uh, total dest destruction and how uh, use of certain technology is based on premises that are just, I'm sorry to say it, but are just bullshit. And this is uh, how I could uh, perceive like the roots of, of, of facial recognition, but maybe Benjamin would like to go on what facial recognition already uh, uh, means just all in all. I would like to uh, just uh, add on the whole identity thing. <clears throat> I personally, as a Roma person, um, I think I should be able to be proud to identify as a Roma in public. But at the same time, it is worrying me that I hate that I need to live in a world where I have to feel that I have to hide my Roma identity because this very identity can be uh, used against me because it's it's something that can get me in trouble, uh, being Roma, for example. And uh, having governments um, using this identity or data about Roma in that way is totally uh, unacceptable. Um, we should be proud of our identity. Like, uh, after all, our power is in our numbers, in a way. Um, the data about the the data about Roma that we are collecting and using uh, is necessary to detect and fix systemic discrimination, for example. Uh, so we we kind of depend on this in to a certain extent when it is used by people who are willing to use this data uh, for our benefit. But if it falls in the wrong hands, of course, um, then then it it won't be used for those things, and that. As Roxy mentioned, we have plenty of historical proof that in the wrong hands, Roma will uh, data about Roma will be used against us. Completely. I mean, what what you're both saying is is really chilling, and you know, we absolutely see those parallels with the way that we saw the Nazi regime experimenting against certain groups. We're completely seeing that being replicated in uses of biometric technologies today. I mean, we've we've even seen the EU itself. Uh, developing so-called lie detector tests to use it against people at borders. You know, it's it's always certain groups that are the ones that are marked out as these test subjects for new technologies, whether the technology is facial recognition or whether it's the sort of technologies that they had in, in the 1940s. It's all about these technologies that are used as tools by, by humans, by groups in ways that can persecute people. Um, and I think also your point, Roxy, about this very premise of identifying people through their faces and bodies as being a, a fundamentally flawed idea because it's based on that social construct of identity it is really powerful and, and also a really important idea when we're trying to resist the use of this technology in ways that are harmful for our communities. So maybe now is a good point to uh, step into the tech a little bit and ask Benjamin if you could tell us actually what facial recognition really is and you know, why this is an important topic. 
For sure. Uh, facial recognition is part of biometrics mass surveillance. Um, it is first maybe good to identify what is biometric data. Uh, it is both physical identifiers like your fingerprints, your face uh, uh, fingerprint and your voice, your DNA is also a physical identifier, but it also goes into the behavioral identifiers. So here we have our patterns uh, online, uh, what kind of activities we do on the internet, what are our typing patterns, how long we we spend time on certain types of media, how do we consume media, etc. So th these are all there to build this biometric data, including facial recognition, is there to build um, predictions, decisions, and these predictions and decisions are usually used by governments or corporations in some cases. Uh, for us, especially worrying is uh, the use cases in policing and uh, public security, as well as in the justice system. Um, um, and sometimes it can also be used to manipulate uh, behavior or choices of a population through through the understanding of these biometric information. And um, maybe I can just um, follow up on this uh, from a moral philosophy point of view. Um, mass surveillance has been so we all know um our european governments have a fetish let's say for surveillance um for example in germany i'm just going to give some examples here um in germany police retrospectively searched footages from the g20 summit protest to try to identify these protesters which is kind of scary uh, why have the freedom to go to a protest if this can be used against you, you know? And then in the UK as well, another example, uh, during the Nothing Hill Carnival, which is organized by people of color, um, they are trying, they were trying to identify people of interests in the crowds using the same kind of technology. Um, uh, th this is just two examples of intrusiveness uh, of, of these kind of technologies. And to bring it back to moral philosophy, um, surveillance and the individual rights to privacy, they have been actually debated for centuries, 200 years ago. Um, the utilitarianist Jeremy Bentham, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, he proposed this idea of the infamous panopticon. Uh, it is the hypothetical perfect prison where people are being constantly watched by a watcher and uh, the idea behind this type of surveillance was that you can control people easier if you watch them and if they know they are being watched so um, basically it's kind of like a big brother idea and uh, they try so utilitarianists they try to justify breaching your right your individual right to privacy because it increases the security of the nation and everyone will be happier um, so basically today, if the government is accessing people's private data on the internet to locate individuals who are a terrorist threat, that can be morally justifiable. Uh, that's just a utilitarian way of justifying things. Um, in the case of biometric mass surveillance, a utilitarian like Jeremy Bentham would argue that is okay. Um, if it truly increases public security and if the majority of people are in the end better off with this than without it. However, if mass surveillance is not found to actually increase security, if it misidentifies a, a bunch of people and it does, uh, it's totally inaccurate. Um, if it's used to intimidate people, if it's used to target a whole nation or a whole ethnic group, or race, uh, and if it results in fear and di uh, distrust, then a utilitarianist would uh, deem this technology as no longer morally justifiable because it is not maximizing happiness. So in this context, in the real world context, biometric mass surveillance is not morally justifiable. But the scary thing is that the infrastructure is already here across Europe, it's already being used, it's already being deployed or tested in many countries, um, and we, the surveilled citizens, are not even asked how we feel about it. In many cases, we don't even know it is happening, and that is the scary part.
Absolutely. And I think given the, the links that you mentioned to things like you know, racialized policing and, and the criminal justice context, there was a report earlier this month that, that showed evidence of how different European justice systems are you know, inherently and structurally uh, discriminatory against Roma and Sinti people. So when we see this almost perfect storm of racialized policing and racist criminal justice systems now with this extra layer of, of facial recognition and other biometric tech that we sometimes even hear is is neutral um, which of course we know is not true it, it's not neutral in how it's deployed um, it's not neutral in how it's developed um, but it, you know, it, it poses a threat to all of us but especially so for for certain communities. So I know, Roxy, when we were kind of preparing this, this webinar, and it came up a little bit earlier as well, um, that Romani history, you know, data collection is, is a really pertinent issue. And, and you link that to this, this idea of, of it tangibly posing a risk to safety. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that and, and, and why this idea of the mass data collection, the, the fetish as, as Benjamin referred to it, which I think is a really good way to describe it, uh, why that does feel like a tangible threat to Roma and Sinti. Well, let, let me phrase it like this. When we're talking about safety, because this is always the argument for for the collection of that data, for that surveillance that Benjamin described so very well. You know, whose, whose safety are we talking about? Romani people's safety, it isn't. Because you know what, our perpetrators, we are not the perpetrators of ourselves. And we're not the perpetrators towards black people. We're not the perpetrators towards Jewish people. Romani people never in the history of mankind have started a war, have never developed nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons or whatever. We are not the perpetrators in history. However, you know, the perpetrators, the historical perpetrators, let us talk about white people. It's white people's safety. So everything of that technology, from the algorithms to the artificial intelligence part that is analyzing your face via your, your, your uh, mobile phone camera, whatever, you know, it's based on the premises of the developers. And it's based on the safety um, definition of the developers. And the developers, and this is why rep representation of Roma and Sinti, and as well as intersectional experts of different communities, from Black to Jewish to, to Muslim, whatever, is so highly important. Because as long as the majority of developers of such tech, and as well as the Thai policies, are white people, it will always be based on the, on the, on the definition of safety for white people. And white people have uh, embraced historically the stereotypes against Romani people as, for example, criminals. So what it doesn't matter what we do, we are always tied to criminality. The definition of our existence is tied to a uh, definition of criminality or existence is criminalized. So it, it doesn't matter what we do, we will always be uh, a criminals in the perception of the people who are developing this technology. So when we are starting to talk about safety for everybody and human rights for everybody, particularly in the digital field, we need to start to uncover the hidden premises of the development of such technology and we start to dis we need to start to dismantle it and then then we get to the point where we can start to talk about the use of such technology in the development because at the at the moment, people who are developing the tech and advocating for that kind of tech, they are always like, um, you know, they are taking as a premise the thought of an ideal world where everybody is equal and discrimination does not happen and it's such a low risk. Of course, for white people, it's such a low risk because the whole system is made for white people and white people's safety. But it's white people, are not, not the majority, is not even white. You know, it's a minority that is white and privileged when we're talking about social contracts, not uh, only about white skin. As, as you can see, my skin is also uh, pretty fair. However, I would always be, um, and I have always been affected by discriminatory systems. And you can even see that not, not only in facial recognition systems and biometric um, data collection, but even in the way that algorithms are coded like they are coded on the premises and stereotypes of those people who are coding them and as there's no Romani people no black people nobody of us is present to be like okay you who was like developing google's algorithm for their search uh, they never reflect on that they never reflect on it they just develop it and by developing it the racism and the racist stereotypes are once again perpetrated and 
uh, continued. You know, it's a repetition of everything. Just for an example, because there's so much data uh, that is based on stereotype uh, stereotype uh, premises is fed into Google's algorithm. Google's algorithm right now, and this is very sensitive to even say that, is is constructed in a way that if I'm looking for a footballer with a typical in German typical uh, Sinti name, I will get uh, suggestions by the Google algorithm of 10 others of their lineage, you know, of their whole ancestry. And if I was a, a right wing terrorist, I will just need to note down what Google has just given to me to uh, to get uh, my uh, my aims for my next white supremacist terrorist attack when we're talking about terrorism and how to prevent it. And the next thing is the moment I'm searching for one of these names, it's Google's algorithm automatically ties this name to criminality. So I get among the search results that I was looking for, I'm getting search results that tie these names to criminal um, incidents, to pictures, to whatever. So automatically, Google makes an assumption of the developer of that algorithm, which is not free from racism. So we cannot argue that this kind of technology can be used for any purpose that would not include racism, as long as racism and, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, group based uh, hatred against certain groups marginalized groups is present in the in the vast majority of society we cannot or we have to take it as a default that it will always include racism and discriminatory um mechanisms and we have to find out and figure out how to prevent it when technology is developed rather than when it's already developed and people try to advocate why it should stay like this with policy making on a European level where they exclude the people that would have the arguments why it should not be like that. Absolutely. I, I think we really do see the, the full extent and the, the depth at which this racism and these structural discriminatory practices are embedded in so much of the technology that we interact with every day. and those questions of whether we could ever make it not discriminatory, I think are really interesting. And a, a lot of people in the digital rights world are starting to wrestle with this idea of you know, decolonizing the tech field, decolonizing the digital rights field, doing this really powerful work to consider what these questions actually mean. Um, I know even personally, when, when I was studying a few years ago, and um, I was looking at what um, at, at the idea of algorithmic bias and what a non-biased algorithm would even look like. And I, I recall speaking to my professor about what, what would a non-biased world look like? Can we even imagine that? You know, what does that really mean? So I think you know, we're really going into um, these really deep structural questions. Um, and then, of course, when it when it comes to the facial recognition context, I think we would go as far as to say, even if we were in some theoretical world able to make these these tools able to not be discriminatory, to not be racist, if anything, they would be able to even more accurately target uh, whichever groups that the, the police might be deploying them against. So you know, that's part of what underpins the work that we're doing through the Reclaim Your Face campaign to say that when they're used for mass surveillance, there's no place whatsoever for these uses in our society. Um, so maybe passing back over to Benjamin, um, if you wanted to kind of reflect on, on what Roxy shared um, and whether there's other areas of technological discrimination in the context of the work that you do that you would like to share. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I can maybe share uh, things based on the research I do for uh, OSF Roma, in, uh, Roma uh, initiatives office and point out kind of like four critical areas that Roma could be discriminated against when it comes to these uh, data-based technologies. Um, the first one is biometric mass surveillance uh, that we already talked about. The second one is the use of biased algorithms in predictive policing and predictive sentencing. Uh, the, then the third one is the, uh, any kind of scoring systems or tools that kind of resemble social scoring um, or any kind of uh, tools based, uh, technology based tools that access, that restrict your access to services like healthcare, social security, credit loans, education, employment, etc. Uh, and um, if I didn't mention healthcare as well. Um, and then the last one is um, the use of technology to 
kind of predict our behavior and also manipulate our opinion and behavior. And this is something that Roxy mentioned, and I'm really glad she did uh, with the Google algorithm. Um, and it's something that we should understand that these tools aren't only deployed by states, by governments, like in policing. Uh, these are also deployed by private corporations like big tech organizations who are using it to, to subconsciously or um, implicitly and in a very slow but massive way uh, shift our public opinion, um, which can definitely have a huge impact on our how, how we shape our society, how we shape our public opinion about Roma and Sinti, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then just to reflect on the on the um, on the use of predictive policing and predictive sentencing um, for a second, I, I would like to give an example with uh, pr predictive policing. For example, in uh, Western Europe, it's uh, being very much used the automatic number plate recognition (ANPR), um, which is basically a technology that has the ability to search for license plates of a particular nationality. Um, it's basically kind of like a facial recognition for cars, but it also links it to the nationality and that can also be discriminatory towards Roma, Sinti travelers, you know, people who live in caravans and so on. And then the other one is predictive sentencing, which is used in the uh, uh, justice system. And those are algorithms that are used to detect the risk of a person as uh, ridiculous as that sounds sounds uh, they use uh, they analyze a series of decisions made by, made by people uh, against a database to to predict whether this person is at low risk medium risk or high risk whether they will commit the crime again and this is used to determine the duration of prison sentences or parole and that has been used in the uk uh, it's called heart and previously also in the US, uh, a system called Compass. So there are precedents for these softwares. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Benjamin, and go for it, Roxy. Um, I just uh, thank you very much. Yeah, but what Benjamin mentioned and also what came to my mind while he was talking was also when we were uh, talking in advance with uh, or exchange with Adri and DFF, uh, around how public mass surveillance and facial recognition technology is targeting Romani people who are at the borders. You know, for example, those who migrate from uh, really like life-threatening uh, or not migrate but flee from life-threatening con um, conditions within the EU and how facial recognition technology is used to refuse uh, those people from getting into another country, another place where they would be safer because, you know, the um, the, the premise is that this technology can see who is Roma and who are not, you know, predict it. And also it ties, it ties the Romani identity to human trafficking. I have been thinking about, uh, about this issue for a very long time and it upsets me deeply. Why? Because now we also have to shift the paradigm of who is criminal and who is not. Romani people are a prone target of human trafficking. This is true because, of course, if I was a human trafficker, who would I look for? A target who will not be missed if I traffic that target and sell that human to other people for whatever purpose, okay? So, of course, there is so many people who suffer from the issue of not having passports, of not having a nationality. Of course, these people are very vulnerable when it comes to human trafficking. Again, but however, how is human trafficking done? Human trafficking happens on the dark net. Who has access to the dark net? It's not the Romani people living in impoverished conditions who don't not even have access to electricity. It's white people who know how to trade Bitcoin. Those stock trading people are the ones who are trading humans on the internet, children and whatever, and Romani people as well. It's not the Romani people who are really the criminals behind that kind of human trafficking. However, who is held accountable? It's the Romani people who are held accountable for the criminality of white people who are trading bitcoins and humans on the dark net, who Romani people do not even have access to. And this is what really is upsetting me every time when we're talking about this facial recognition and algorithms and all the technology and when it's 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 
advocated in the sense of, oh yeah, we are talking here about security issues, etc., etc., etc. Again, we are not the perpetrators. We are not the criminals in that case, particularly when it comes to digitalization and tech issues. It's because we do lack the access to even do that, even if we wanted to do that. You know, this is like, so we definitely have to shift the whole gaze, how we look at that issues of security and whatever that tech is developed for and look who is really doing the criminal activities we want to prevent and whose safety and human rights we are preventing by the technology that um, we introduce on a European and global level. So yeah, just uh, just my two cents on this. I couldn't agree more and, and I think it's a really important point actually how these facial recognition technologies and other surveillance technologies are being used to criminalize certain types of people and behavior and not others because you know, even the automatic number plate recognition systems that, that Benjamin mentioned, we've seen them being used to you know, look at parking violations, for example, which are, are really petty violations in the grand scheme of things. And to be intruding on people's privacy and autonomy and freedom because of a parking violation is very disproportionate. Similarly, we've seen um, things like loitering and uh, littering as the sorts of cr crimes that are picked up by these systems. Whereas things like financial crimes, you know, white collar financial crimes, state crimes, genocide, wars, you know, are absolutely not the target of these technologies. So I think there's a real um, underlying ideology that we're really starting to unpack with these conversations. And, and that idea of, of shifting the gaze is so important. Um, so I would like to ask you both now uh, how these issues we've been talking about, facial recognition in particular, but perhaps also these other forms of technologically driven discrimination, how they tangibly impact on Roma and Sinti ability to recognize kind of your rights, how, how Romani rights are being obstructed through the use of these technologies. Um, I don't know who would like to go first. Yeah, Benjamin, please go for it. Uh, thank you. Um, I used to work three years um for the European Roma Rights Center. And I understand there's a lot of um, strain on the legal system in Europe. There's a lot of cases, right? Which uh, makes justice not always fast. Um, and then with this technological um, boom that we are ex experiencing with this paradigmatic shift, basically, um, it's, it's just, gonna make the whole thing slower i feel like the whole criminal justice system so judges lawyers legislators and the police included um, they're poorly prepared to deal with this and um, it is quickly evolving this intersection of technology and discrimination so um, law enforcement is is like already using these tools but like all of these other components of the criminal justice systems are not ready to deal with the incoming uh incoming kind of cases and then again uh, roma ngos and civil societies are equally disconnected from the decision making as we mentioned earlier which makes us in a way kind of sitting ducks in this situation we are just waiting for the things to happen <laughs> and um it, it's 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 particularly challenging technological racism technological discrimination is particularly challenging for realizing roma rights I can only second again uh, what uh, Benjamin said, and uh, I feel we have had already during our conversation many examples how Romani communities, uh, the broad range of all the different communities, and not only us, but the, we are not only Romani people. Romani people can be black, can be LGBTIQ people, can be women, can be children, can be whatever. So there's a broad range of communities tied to this issue when we are talking about Romani rights in digital environments and how they are infringed or experiencing infringement due to everything we mentioned and what goes beyond of this. Um, I feel it is necessary to create an awareness on every side that there needs to be the perspective or a, a shift of the gaze 
as we have mentioned, or it, how it was mentioned by you, Allah, and that uh, the perspective of women people needs to be into taken into account. And we have to talk about how do we take it into account. Like you know, you cannot. Uh, it's it's Benjamin said we are waiting for things to happen, and we don't know because we are all around how to engage with it. So whose responsibility is it to include the women in perspectives? It's those. It's the responsibility of those who are privileged now. So tech experts, tech companies, maybe in the private sector, may it be from the side of policymakers, they need to start to empower Romani communities to have a say in this. With all everything that that means to uh, give up resources or, or share resources with that, share privileges, give lit digital literacy to those communities, support those communities and legislators in their uh, digital emancipation and take away the shame from this. This will not only be helpful for urban communities, but also for white people who are now like making decisions on tech that they don't not really understand. And as they are so overwhelmed with all that development that is going on, we have an Elon Musk that is trying to get to Mars, etc. And people are like, oh, well, I uh, I barely know how to use my uh, smartphone, you know. So we need to get the shame, uh, uh, get rid of the shame and start openly talking about, okay, where are we lacking literacy and how to get that literacy out for the people. Completely, and um, I'm really glad you also brought up. <laughs> yeah, I can see Benjamin clapping there totally. Um, but this this whole conversation, I feel, has been so quotable. I'm, I'm, you're both on fire. It's it's fantastic. But um, yeah, I'm I'm really glad, Roxy, that you brought up that that idea of intersectionality because it, it also wouldn't be the right thing for us to view. Uh, you know, Romani identity as a homogenous thing or as something that that doesn't exist. Um, also, that exists. In, in isolation, but rather we need to look at discrimination against Roma and Sinti in the context of other forms of racism and other forms of discrimination um, to take that intersectional approach if we're going to be able to, to tackle some of these really broad existential questions that, that we're facing at the moment. Um, so absolutely. Um, but I really like that, that those points you made about ideas of resistance and what sorts of things we can do uh, in the future, how we can challenge some of these things. So uh, maybe Ben, if I could put you on the spot, what, what else can we do to resist this? And you know, why should anyone that cares about equality and justice uh, across Europe and, and the world be paying attention to, to these, the rise of facial recognition and other biometric mass surveillance technologies? Why should we all be invested in resisting this? So I can see, I, I will make a comparison of this issue with the climate change crisis. Climate change was a thing um, and it was discovered and theorized 100 years ago, approximately. Um, and people at that time didn't believe it. They, they just, what is climate change? We, we love carbon. We love everything that gives us prosperity and money. And we don't see any bad consequences. And honestly, even today, uh, <laughs> people are still saying that um, they don't see climate change as the real threat of today's world. Um, of course, now we have a hundred years later, we have the UN climate agreement, the green deal is coming up, Greta Thunberg and the extinction rebellion. It's, it's a hype, but we should have done this way earlier. We could have prepared sooner, built resilience, prevented a lot of environmental damage and socioeconomic damage, etc. Uh, maybe even reverse it if we acted on time. And it's the same thing with this. So we are at the dawn of this paradigmatic shift in technology. We have AI, machine learning, biometrics coming up. Um, and this comes with a host of new problems that we are all really aware of now. Um, and now is the time for us to build our safeguards, to protect our communities, to prepare our justice system, et cetera for the potential damages and to contribute in shaping legislation like the one you mentioned in a couple of days from now and the AI legislation, the DSA legislation, the GDPR that is already there. We all need to have a voice in how we want, in which direction we want uh, technology to go to be more like efficiency centric or human centric and have fundamental rights as a 
cornerstone. And um, yeah, this is why we need to act now, because if we don't do it now, then uh, it will be much, much harder to solve the consequences in the later stage. We definitely need to just uh, now in our last minutes uh, give up some advice what needs to be done like on the on everything we have discussed here what does it mean for people working in tech right now particularly the white people in powerful positions it means to take into consideration uh romani people not only when it comes to the talk of racism but there is people like benjamin or i would not call myself that much of an expert but like you know there's nerdy people in the romani community get them into tech positions into high uh, high profile positions where they are able to make decisions so they can prevent tech companies, private companies, or even NGOs from making bad decisions, may, may it be on technology development, may it be on uh, policy making, get them into powerful positions, uh, establish Romani leadership, black leadership, LGBTIQ women leadership. This is the way to go when we are talking about the private ship also uh, when it comes to tech. Uh, on the other hand, what does it mean for Romani self-organizations? Many self-organizations are not really working on these issues. And you need to get involved, people. This is really, uh, I feel this is the most urgent message, like get rid of the chain, start to advocate for literacy programs, not only for the organizations themselves, digital literacy um, uh, courses, but also digital literacy for the broad Romani community, because I don't want to see Romani people sending out the private pictures and data on, on social media in five years without thinking twice where does my data go, or even know what the term data means in terms of like, you know, names, addresses, numbers, however. And this is happen currently happening and we need to work on this. And we also need to get involved in policy making. And for this, we need profound, knowledge so when uh, there's uh, people from um, the open society foundation already uh, engaged in this i want to see the people from oce level organizations to uh, uh, smaller organizations working on local levels and uh, starting to get involved and i want to um, want the last message to be uh, for the funders because there's also fund givers who are funding this kind of programs and you really should be the driving force uh, for not only for Romani organizations and activists but also for um, for everybody, all the marginalized communities, they need digital literacy and they need to get involved. So start to give out funding for this. And this is the point where I would like to advocate my uh, good friend and colleague Gilda and me, we have started the Romlock Academy, which uh, I also uh, presented to Edri, and we want to have a, a coding summer school. And uh, so if ever, anybody wants to fund this a Romani uh, coding school, please uh, get in touch with us. This is what we need, these kind of ideas forward ideas and we want to have Benjamin there and other tech uh, tech involved Romani people who need to not only talk about technology but get involved in creating that kind of technology. Thanks Roxy, so many ideas there, um, fantastic and, and yeah if anyone has got deep pockets and that is listening I would I would strongly encourage you to, to reach in there and and see what you can do to help because I think that's fantastic. Um, Benjamin, what about you? Any final thoughts on on what next? I'm I'm really excited uh, about this this uh, topic, um, and I'm really grateful for Roxy for mentioning this uh, on the Roma Academy for coding because that's something that is missing, and I agree uh, with everything she said. Uh, I would also add that we we need to build capacity uh, of Roma in STEM fields, right? Um, like computer science or researchers in AI and data ethics, etc. Uh, these are the so be, beyond just building the basic literacy, the digital literacy to overcome the gap. We should also build the expertise, right? And that's why I would also invite anyone in this call and beyond. Um, if anyone has examples, um, concerns, questions, or ideas related to technological discrimination of particularly Roma people, uh, please feel free to contact me. F feel free to contact Roxy. We would love to, you know, build up on this, uh, to build a research, to build like not a base of knowledge on 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 this 
to understand better the digital gap, to better understand the the digital literacy and the the threats from these technologies. And I feel like this kind of coalition is very, very, very important. Last word on that coalition thing. I uh, I did not forget it. Of course, we all. Uh, we, we are calling out all Romani organizations, all intersectional uh, organizations to join the Reclaim Your Face campaign, which we are now here for because coalition building, what Benjamin mentioned, is the key. And I'm very thankful, grateful uh, beyond words for Edwin's support and the DFF support of our communities to uh, become visible in tech and digitalization and to uh, invest so much resources uh, to raise awareness and also uh, to fight human rights infringements on a policy and uh, political um, dimension and also support us uh, when it comes to technical issues, et cetera, et cetera. This is really what we need. This kind of engagement is really powerful. So thank you very much, Ella, for inviting us today. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, we've covered so much, but I also feel like we've only just scratched the surface. So I really hope that this is the first of many engagements to come. Um, I'm, you know, I, I feel that we've really explored how facial recognition tools and you know, other biometric tools pose such a threat to Roma and Sinti. But at the same time, we can't just jump all the way into this advanced tech without looking at the wider context and the digital gaps and other inequalities that exist there. Um, for those that are uh, participating, um, we're going to be sending out a reading list uh, soon after this webinar for those that would like to know more. Um, and this AI legislation that's coming out on Wednesday, um, we are, uh, as EDRI, engaging with lots of anti-discrimination and racial justice groups in how we respond to this AI legislation because it is so important that we're looking at how AI can, uh, can perpetuate and amplify uh, social uh, inequality and discrimination. So for those that have been listening along, um, one small action you can take is to sign the Reclaim Your Face petition if you're an EU citizen, um, which is calling on the European Commission to ban facial recognition in public spaces when it's used for mass surveillance. Um, but there's so many other things that, that you can do to get involved as well. So I've, I've put a link to our website in the chat. Um, and yeah, I, I hope that we'll get the chance to continue this. So I, I'll just end with an enormous thank you to Benjamin and Roxy for sharing with us your experiences, your expertise, your thoughts on this uh, enormous topic. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you both. Um, and once I switch off the recording in a moment, I would encourage you to leave your contact details in the chat if you would like to share them with those that have attended today so that they can um, follow up with you. But I will stop the recording now uh, with a huge thank you to everyone.